Welcome to the Lords and Heroes section of my Tomb King guide. In this video, we'll cover the Lords and Heroes of the Tomb King factions, including campaign and battle, as well as abilities and unique effects. Disclaimer, this guide is based on my personal experience and opinions, and is by no means the definitive way to play the game in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. Now that's out of the way, let's get into the video. At the time of writing, the Tomb Kings have access to four legendary lords across four factions. Which lord you pick will have some minor and major effects on how they play in campaign as well as battle. On the whole, I'd say the Tomb Kings have a small but powerful roster of characters to choose from, with a shining example being the Necrotex, with their ability to buff constructs in your army simply by being there. Some characters can also spawn with traits that increase the capacity for certain units, which is ridiculously useful since it's really the major area where the Tomb Kings struggle. Something that I'm not in love with is the multi-role Tomb Princes. Normally something doing two things at once is good, but due to the severely limited capacity for these guys, it just means you're going to have to be even more sparing when using them for one use or another. There's also a real lack of variety among the generic lords, and while the research tree has some with great effects, it'd still be nice to see a mage or a ranged lord to add some variety to the comps. That being said, they still have access to three Lords of Magic, and for the most part they're all okay, even if they aren't my personal favourites. They also have a pretty good selection of mounts, particularly the Lords where you can get War Sphinxes and stuff, and while the Skeletons, Steeds and Chariots are a bit naff, I think for the most part they're pretty good. One thing that doesn't make any sense to me is how there's a f***ing ice cream truck when the coronavirus is on and it's f***ing freezing outside. One thing that doesn't make any sense to me is how the starting units for each of the factions take away from your overall unit capacity rather than adding to it. Like if Kalida spawns with a Sepulchral Stalker, then it only makes sense that she has the capacity for it right out the gate, even if she can't recruit it till later. The fact that the armies are a touch reliant on lords like the Vampire Counts always bothered me too. While the lords aren't bad by any means, they are nowhere near as good as the Vampire Counts for helping the army, and they don't even have access to any healing, so for the most part, your bad units will just stay bad. Finally, I have to say that the ability to passively generate Canopic Jars is great for stockpiling, especially once you get into the endgame and have a lot of characters on the go. Now with all that being said, let's get into the Lords. First up we have Cetra the Imperishable, who is in control of the Kemri faction. Has only one king. Choosing him grants the faction plus 2 public order, plus 10 growth, and minus 1 construction time for all settlement buildings faction wide. His personal army basks in the glow of his plus 100% leadership aura size and also gets 10% casualty replenishment rate for Tomb Guard and Skeleton Chariots. His starting army gets a Skeleton Chariot, Kemrian War Sphinx, and some Tomb Guard Halberds. In battle, he is an armoured spellcaster that deals armour piercing anti large damage, and he is a monster. He is amazing on the front lines for both raw damage output and spell support, and he really is the best lord on the roster for ease of use and massive damage. He has access to the spells of Nehekara, and he has the choice of three mounts a Skeletal Steed, Cameron War Sphinx, and Chariot of the Gods. He also has the abilities The Curse, The Restless Dead, Unyielding Will, and Wrath of Petra. Leveling him, you want to go Blue Tree and start generating some Canopic Jars. You can go to Lightning Strike if and when you feel the need, but for now, I'd say getting into the Red Tree is for the best and focusing on Constructs so that you're prepared for the endgame. The Unyielding Will line is another great choice, and of course, he's got some great mounts to choose from, and it's really down to personal preference. Ceremonial Bandages, Embalmed in Elixir, and Return to Madness are all great choices, and finally, his spells are okay, but not game changers if you want to give them a miss. He has access to three missions. The Crown of Nehekara sets you against a Norsken force that is spread across the entire map. It's fairly weak, but it is very spread out, so you need to be careful not to get surrounded, and pace your army so that you can make it to the end with something left alive. For the most part, it's quite basic and weak units with a couple of monster and artillery units, but it should be no trouble for an early to mid game army. The item you get grants some great bonuses in battle as well as campaign, and even comes with a passive ability. The Blessed Blade of Petra pits you against a mixed force of Greenskins, Dwarves and Empire units from a roaming faction, and they're separated into two smaller forces. This does mean you need to do some light micro to take them on one at a time, but it's not too bad so you should be just fine. Overall it's a fairly tough battle, with a solid mid game army you should be able to take out without too much trouble. The item gained grants some powerful bonuses for Cetra himself, a public order bonus, and an ability. Finally, we have the Battle of the Black Pyramid, and this battle is weird since it's actually available for every Tomb King faction in some form or another, so I'll go over it once here and point out any differences later. It sends you versus two armies with two armies supporting you, and once the battle gets going, Arkham will also appear, so it can be quite tough to pace yourself to make sure you have enough energy and health to take him out. Since this is a battle intended for the end of the Vortex campaign, it only makes sense that it's best to take an endgame comp and that you're prepared for the difficult fights no matter what. 
Next up we have High Queen Kalida, who is in control of the court of Liberas faction. All vampires shall pay. Choosing her grants the faction plus 20 relations with other Tomb Kings and plus 20% ammo for all armies. Her army gains poison attacks on all units, minus 50% casualties from all attrition, and plus 3 untainted locally. Her starting army gets Skeleton Archers, Necropolis Knights, and Sepulchral Stalkers. In battle, she's an armoured anti-infantry unit with poison attacks. She's great for supporting your front lines against some particularly tough units, and while she can do okay in Lord Jewels, it's really not her best use case, so be sure to give her some support. She has no spells, but she does have access to two mounts, Skeleton Chariot and the Necro Serpent, and it's kinda obvious which is the best choice. She also has the abilities of the Curse, Blessing of Asaf, My Will Be Done, Venom Wave, and Tomb Strike. When leveling her, we're going to start in a similar way to Cetra. Blue Tree to get some Canopic Jars on the go, and to pave the way for a future Lightning Strike. Red Tree focusing on Constructs is always a good option, and then the Asaf Goddess of Magic and Vengeance is real spicy too. You should always get her Necro Serpent mount because it's just better than the Chariot, but if it fits your playstyle then go right ahead. Finally, Embalmed and Elixir and Ceremonial Bandages are also good for making her just a little bit tougher in combat. She has access to two missions, one of which being the Black Pyramid which I just explained, so I won't waste your time going over it again. Her other mission is the Venom Staff, and it's against a varied and wave-based vampire counts army. They will gradually come from different directions, so it's definitely best that you hold your ground and keep some units available to defend your flanks to ensure you don't get surrounded. Overall, it's a pretty straightforward mission, and you should be just fine with a balanced mid-game comp. The item gain turns her into even more of a force in battle, as well as giving her a magical missiles ability. What are you doing here? Oh, it must be another sponsor spot! What about that? Since we only have about two sponsors for the channel right now, we are going to talk about Audible again, but don't you worry, I've got some brand new spicy books to recommend. But first, let me tell a little bit more about Audible, if you didn't know. So if you didn't know already, Audible has the world's largest collection of audio books, audio dramas and audio shows in the entire universe, or known universe at least. Uh, they're narrated by some of the most fabulous voices in the world. Voices like Emma Thompson, voices like Claire Danes, voices like my personal favourite, Stephen Fry. You can listen anywhere you want. Once you have a subscription, you can download your book, listen to it offline. So you can listen to it on a plane, on a train, on an automobile. Uh, although you might not want to put your headphones in when you're driving a car at least. You can listen on your computer or you can listen on an app on your phone. It's all downloaded offline. They even have a handy little car mode. Look at that. So you can just easy, one tap, it's going. It's time to tap it again, it stops, skip back. Select chapters, it's fantastic. So my personal favourites I've listened to so far, I mentioned Mythos in the last one. Currently, I'm listening to The Witcher and I'm loving it. It's not all The Witcher books, it's The Witcher as uh, as it was in the Netflix series. So it's a little bit more condensed and got the more essential well, essential stories in if you want to get some more depth from the Netflix series. It's really entertaining. The narrator makes sure to differentiate between which character is speaking as, so you can really kind of get into the story and get really immersed. You may be wondering how does it actually work? And basically you just start a subscription. It's $7.99 a month by default. Not for you, but we'll get to that later. So it's $7.99 a month, and you get one credit, and you can spend that on any book in the entire audiobook library. When you have membership, you also get exclusive access to the audio shows and audio dramas, completely separate to your books, by the way. And also, once you cancel your subscription, you get to keep all the things that you've downloaded so far and not give them back. So you could subscribe for a month, and then if you don't listen to that full book, you can just cancel it for a month, finish listening to the book, restart your subscription, get another book, listen for three months, you know, just kind of pick it up when you want. You can also buy extra credits if you need to, and you get discounts on that if you are an Audible member. If you're not an Audible member, you kind of have to pay the full price for these books, which ends up being three or four times the price that you'd be paying for an Audible membership. So it's kind of a no-brainer. Also, if you get halfway through a book and decide, you know what, I'm not really enjoying this, you can exchange that book. Again, this is exclusive to members only. But you can just say, I don't want this book, give it back, you get your credit back, and then you can spend it on another book. A few of my friends, I have two offers. A 30-day free trial. At the end of that 30 days, it will go into a payment cycle and charge you $7.99 unless you cancel the subscription. So what you can do, you can start a free trial, get a book that you want to try, then cancel the subscription, and then if you like it, I've got another deal for you just right now. The second deal is 50% off your first three months. So instead of paying $7.99, you'll be paying $3.99. And that will get you for the first three months. After that, it will go into $7.99, but you're saving, you know, about £12 there. So you can't really complain about that. Both of these things are only one book memberships. But as I said before, you can exchange, you can get different audio dramas, you can get discounts. So it all really is kind of in one condensed package here. That's a pretty good deal if you ask me. I do personally use Audible sometimes when I'm recording clips for videos, I'm just listening to The Witcher and just, you know, getting into it. It helps my time pass much faster, it's great for if you're in a boring workplace or a long commute, uh, on a plane, on a train, going to sleep, you can find relaxing books that can help you drift off to sleep. Anything really, they've got the biggest library in the world, so you've got to find something, right? That's it, all the links are in the description. One of them is for the free trial and one of them is for the 50% off your first three months. Click those down below depending on what you want. It supports the channel, and you can get some pretty cool stuff for yourself. What is not to love? Okay, now back to your regularly scheduled guide. 
Next up we have Arkin the Black, and he's in control of the followers of Nagash. The Liber Mortis reveals all. Choosing him grants the faction minus 50 relations with other Tomb Kings, plus 10 wins of magic reserve for all armies, and some vampire units and immunity to vampire attrition, but I talked about that more in my campaign video. His army gets plus 5 melee attack and defense for embedded heroes, and his starting army gets Felbats, Crypt Ghouls, and a Tomb Scorpion. In battle, he's an armored spellcaster, and while he can do some good work and last a long time in battle, he's not the best at doing damage since he has a severe lack of armor piercing damage, but he's pretty good at supporting the front lines nevertheless. He has access to the Law of Death, and has the choice of two mounts, a Skeletal Steed, or a Skeleton Chariot. He also has the abilities Life Leeching, The Cursed, My Will Be Done, and Liber Mortis. Leveling him will of course follow a similar pattern to what we've done already. Blue Tree for the Canopic Jars and possible Lightning Strike, Red Tree focusing on Constructs. The Vengeful Tree has some great options, and you should also pick up a Userian God of the Underworld. Of course you want to pick up your preferred mount, and the usual ceremonial bandages, Embalmed and Elixir, and Return to Madness are always a good idea. Finally, you can grab any spells you want to get the most out of his entire kit. He has access to three missions. The first is the Tomb Blade of Arkan, and it puts you against a pretty strong and varied Lizardman army. They come in waves, so it's best to keep some units in reserve to cover your flank, and make sure you last the whole battle. I'd say an early to mid game army should be plenty, as long as you can manage the micro. The item gained is great for buffing Arkan, as well as giving his campaign some improvements and granting an augment ability. The Staff of Nagash is next, and it's a tough battle versus a mixed scaven force that is weak to begin with before becoming much stronger and elite later on. You need to control your units well to keep the fight going on many fronts, but overall you should do just fine with a solid mid game army. The item gained is decent, but isn't really anything worth prioritizing if you have other things to be doing. His final battle is the Battle of the Black Pyramid, and while it is basically the same as the other ones, you're on the opposite side, so you have to fight the United Tomb King factions with two smaller armies backing you up. Since it's an endgame mission, it's best to bring an endgame army comp, and of course it's going to put you through your paces, but as long as you hold the hill and pace yourself well, you should be just fine. Our final legendary lord is Grand Hierophant Katep, and he is in control of the Exiles of Nehek. I will return. Choosing him grants the faction 2 Canopic Jars per turn, minus 40 relations with the Dark Elves, plus 5% campaign move range for all armies, and plus 10% casualty replenishment. He also gains plus 2 capacity and plus 3 recruit rank for Leech Priest. His starting army gets Nehekara Warriors, Carrions, and a Hero Titan. In battle, he's a spellcaster, and not really the best for melee combat, especially once you get to the late game and there's a lot more high damage units on the field. He has access to the lore of Nehekara and the choice of 3 mounts the Skeletal Steed, Skeleton Chariot, and Casket of Souls, making him one of the very few units in the game that can be both a Lord and Artillery. He also has the abilities The Curse, The Restless Dead, My Will Be Done, Arcane Conduit, and Sandstorm. When leveling him, we're going to follow the same start off with as we have every other time. Blue Tree to get some Canopic Jars on the go and to make Lightning Strike available if needed, then the Red Tree focusing on Constructs, the Geheb God of the Earth skill is pretty great, and the Reanimator line is a great choice for all sorts of fantastic bonuses. You want to of course get his Casket of Souls mount as soon as possible since it is so unique and powerful in battle. Arcane Knowledge, Mortuary Cult Scholar, and Witness to the Golden Age are also pretty great, as well as Soul Binding. Finally, you should pick up any spells you fancy. Katep also has access to two missions. The Lich Staff puts you against a mixed Beastmen force that starts out weak before getting some stronger mixed monsters later on. It's best to pace yourself and not overextend so that you don't get separated and surrounded. I'd say you can do this pretty easily with an early to mid game army as long as you manage it well and keep an eye on your flanks. The item gained is okay, but it's not particularly worth prioritizing if you're busy. The other battle is the Battle of the Black Pyramid, and it's basically the same as it is for Cetra and Kalida. Our first and last generic lord is the humble Tomb King. He's armored and shielded, and is an anti infantry melee expert, and is amazing at taking on the enemy front lines along with his units. He has no spells, but does have access to three mounts the Skeletal Steed, the Skeleton Chariot, and a Cameron War Sphinx. He also has the abilities of the Curse, My Will Be Done, Reanimate, and Tomb Strike. Leveling him, you want to of course go Blue Tree for Canopic Jars and Lightning Strike, Red Tree focusing on Constructs, and of course his amazing War Sphinx mount. I personally chose Uzerian, the God of the Underworld, but any in that line are good depending on your comps. And as always, Embalmed in Elixir, Ceremonial Bandages, and Return to Madness are great. Now we come to the heroes, starting with the Necrotect. On the campaign map, they can damage walls, wound enemy heroes, and block armies, as well as boosting income in the local province. Of course, they also increase your chances of discovering undercities, as does every hero, so I'll just mention it once. And when embedded in an army, they increase mobility. In battle, they're anti-infantry units, and their real purpose is to fight alongside your constructs to give them all sorts of fun buffs. 
They won't rack up a tremendous number of kills themselves, but they will ensure that you are getting the very most out of your massive units if you can get them into a cluster. They have no spells, but do have the Skeleton Chariot Mount. They also have the abilities Wrath of the Creator, Stone Shaper, and Restore. When leveling them, I find it's best to build them specifically for armies, since they really do make a huge difference. I grab Mobility and the ever-useful Canopic Jar Hoarder. The aforementioned abilities are all amazing, and the Inscription of Repair Line is borderline arousing. You should of course grab the mount so you can get him around the battlefield where it's needed at a much faster pace. And as always, Ceremonial Bandages is fab, as well as Trap Soul, and it goes without saying, but Immortality is a must as soon as you can. Next up we have the Tomb Prince, and they're a bit of a multi-class. In campaign, they can assault garrisons, assassinate enemy heroes, and assault units. They spread public order in the local region, and when embedded in an army, they provide training. In battle, they're armoured and shielded and deal armour-piercing anti-large damage and are melee experts. This makes them great at supporting your tough units, or even taking on some large units one-on-one -on -one provided they aren't too high tier. They have no spells, but do have two mounting options. The Skeletal Steed, and the Skeleton Chariot. They also have the abilities Guardian, Curse of Jaff, and Tomb Strike. When levelling them, you want to do one of two things, go for Campaign Assassins, or Battlefield Bruisers. For the campaign, you want to focus solely on the blue tree, especially the Specialist and Assassinate skills, to make sure you can take out any pesky enemy heroes. Of course, you always want to get Immortality, but you don't need me to tell you that. For Baal, you want to go more into the Yellow Tree and focus on improving his combat abilities with things like Cultist Prince and Amount. Of course, you want to dip into the Blue Tree a little bit to get Training and Canopic Jars, and as always, Inbound and Elixir and Ceremonial Bandages are always a great choice. Finally, you of course want Immortality. Finally, we come to the Lich Priests, and the only difference between the three of these guys is the spells they can cast, so I'll cover them as one. On the campaign map, they can damage buildings, wound enemy heroes, and hinder replenishment. They also cleanse corruption locally, and when embedded in an army, they can replenish troops. In Baal, they are solely spellcasters and aren't really meant for any real combat. You can send them against some really weak units, but you'd need to be careful and keep an eye on them as they can quickly get overwhelmed. They all have the option of a Skeletal Steed as a mount, as well as the Curse of Kazar ability. The Priest of Death has access to the Law of Death and the Life Leeching ability. The Priest of Light has access to the Law of Light as well as the Exorcism ability, and the Priest of Nehekara has access to the Law of Nehekara and the Restless Dead ability. When levelling them, you want to build them for battle and unlock as many of their spells as you can, since if you aren't using them for their magic, then you shouldn't really be using them. You also want to improve the replenishment ability, as it will help the entire army. The incantation of preservation is pretty great, as well as the ever useful canopic jars. Keeper of the Law and Mortuary Cultist are fab, and the usual ceremonial bandages and trap soul are also always good. Finally, I'd say you want to get the mounts to let them get around and support faster, and of course, you always want immortality so you don't lose all your hard earned levels. Thanks for watching this section of my Tomb King guide. If you want to check out the other parts, there's a link in the card and in the description for a playlist to the series. Don't forget to vote on the poll for the next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description and the comments. If you enjoyed this video at any point, please do consider leaving it a like as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, maybe click that subscribe button so you stay up to date. After all, it is free. For now though, I was Colonel Damdas, and I'll see you next turn. <laughs>